Hello everyone, and welcome to Eorzea Armoire, a series about the background of some of Highlord's more epic and dense weapons, armor, and artifacts. We'll be investigating the lore of these items both within Final Fantasy XIV and the Final Fantasy franchise in general, as well as the amazing and sometimes obscure real-world people, events, and artifacts upon which they are based. If you've been following the series, you know that our relic weapons are distinct for drawing upon a wealth of historical and mythological champions and artifacts. Great men and women of great deeds have shaped the legends of these weapons and greatly informed their Final Fantasy XIV counterparts. And then, there is the Sphira. You'd probably expect the monk relic to refer back to the Eastern martial arts. Today our investigation is actually concerning the ancient Greek and Roman boxing traditions which date back as far as the Minoan and Mycenaean periods. You will see that it is certainly compliant with the gladiatorial tradition that Uldar's pugilists evolved from. Greek boxing had no weight classes or rounds, no breaks and could only be won through knockout, forced submission or death. The overseeing official would generally carry a forked switch or whip to control any fighter that got over-enthusiastic or broke one of the precious few rules. The Aeneid gives us a strong introduction to this blood spot. In Book 5, during a funeral games following the Battle of Troy, Aeneas offers up a prize ox for the winner of a bout. And when the young and notorious champion Dares steps forward, there is a long silence in the crowd before Antellus tosses into the open a massive pair of fighting gauntlets that he inherited from Eryx, a man that had stood against Hercules in a brave duel that Antellus now supposes to appropriate in teaching Dares some humility. Spoke old Antellus, his voice deep in his chest, This, Aeneas, is the armor your brother Eryx used to wear. You see it is still caked with blood and spattered brains. With these he stood that day against great Hercules, with these I used to fight while there was still good blood in me to give me strength before old age came to tangle with me and sprinkled both of my temples with grey. But if Trojan Darius recoils from this armor of ours, and if good Aeneas is satisfied and my patron Ancestes approves, let us level the odds. Then the son of Anchises took out two matching pairs of gauntlets, and tied armor of equal weight to the hands of both men. There was no more delay. Each man took up his stance, poised on his toes, stretching to his full height, guard held high in the air and no sign of fear. They kept their towering heads well back from the punches, and fist struck fist as they warmed to their work. Dares had youth on his side and speed of foot, and Teles had the reach and the weight, but his knees were going. He was slow and shaky, and his whole huge body heaved with the agony of breathing. Blow upon blow drummed on the hollow ribcage, boomed on the chest and showered round the head and ears, and the cheekbones rattled with the weight of the punches. And Tellus held firm in his stance, keeping watchful eyes and swaying away from the bombardment. For Dares, it was like attacking some massive high-built city or besieging a mountain fortress. This way and that he tried, covering all the ground in his maneuvers, pressing hard with all manner of assaults, and all to no avail. Then Entellus drew himself up and showed his right hand raised for the blow, but Dares was quick to see it coming down and backed away smartly. Entellus's full force was in the blow and it met the empty air. Great was his weight and great was the fall of that huge body. But the hero Entellus did not slow down or lose heart because of a fall. He returned to the fray with his ferocity renewed and his anger rousing him to new heights of violence. His strength was kindled by shame at his fall and pride in his prowess, and in a white heat of fury he drove Dares before him all over the arena, hammering him with rights and lefts and allowing no rest or respite. Like hailstones from a dark cloud rattling down on roofs, and Tellus battered Dares with a shower of blows from both hands and sent him spinning. At this point, Aeneas spoke and his voice parted the combatants. And Dares was led back to the ships by his faithful comrades, dragging his weary legs, shaking his head from side to side, and spitting out a mixture of gore and teeth. Then spoke the victor in all his pride of spirit, glorying in the bull he had won. Son of goddess, know this and you too, men of Troy. 
This is the strength there used to be in my body when I was in my prime, and this is the death from which you have rescued Dares. With these words, he took up his stance in front of the bull's head. Then, drawing back his right hand and rising it to his full height, he swung the brutal gauntlet straight down between its horns, shattering the brains and grinding them into the bone. The ox fell and lay full out on the ground, dead and twitching. And these are the words Entella spoke, and spoke them from the heart. The life of this ox is worth more than the life of Dares, and with it, Eryx, I pay my debt to you in full, and here and now, in the moment of victory, I lay down my gauntlets and my heart. What Virgil describes to us in this passage, however, is not the Sphyri, but the Caestus a leather gauntlet inlaid with sharp metal inserts, the Roman modification of the Greek sharp thongs, which used a knuckle duster of hard leather rather than one of iron. Earlier Greek models were essentially latticed strips of hard leather wrapped around the hands and holding a thicker mounded strip across the knuckles, and though they might sound basic and primitive, they would cause a series of painful pockmarks and lacerations with every blow landed. They were nicknamed Myrmikes, or Ants, for their shape and the persistent damage they caused. As testament, the National Museum of Rome displays the Terme Boxer, a statue of a veteran Greek boxer wearing his Myrmikes with very obvious physical scars, including a broken nose, cauliflower ears, and various other marks and cuts to his face accrued over time. Given the established tradition of the relic weapons, you might think that Final Fantasy XIV's Sphyri is a particularly notorious or legendary pair of Myrmikes wielded by a great hero of old. They are indeed a pair of Greek boxing thongs, soft, padded practice gloves, designed to allow boxers to spar in training with zero risk of injury compared to either the proper thongs or bare knuckles. They were used, as Plutarch puts it, so that the bout may not have any serious consequences since the blows are soft and painless. So why would the devs give such a hilariously mundane relic weapon to the monk? Well, the Sphyri were the first of these Greek gloves to fully enclose the fist with a rounded surface, so our relic weapon resembles them in the most general shape. A Geralt story about an archetypical monk wandering the mountains, fighting coels and emulating their movements has no connection to their namesake, so it is possible that someone just thumbed through a thesaurus entry for knuckle dusters. But I think it's more measured and deliberate than that. The monk job quests are focused around balancing the pursuit of martial prowess with the nurturing of one's own discipline and restraint. I believe that the Sphyri is intended not to sharpen and propel the user's chakra so much as it is to curb it, contain it, soften and tame it, preventing the loss of self-control that overcame with Darjilt upon realizing the seventh chakra and becoming consumed by his emotions. So the Greek Sphyri is taken as a metaphor for the Eorzean monk, a kind of weight belt and harness for their chakra. It is an artifact that will restrain their otherwise limitless power and in return keep them grounded and present, continuing to learn without becoming blinded by emotion or energy, even as they fight with all their strength. In short, a safeguard against tunnel vision. A monk that has advanced beyond the need for the Sphyri and can wield any weapon that will limit their power with perfect discipline will be quite a thing to see. Until then, I am Ethis and this is Eorzea Armoire. Please take three seconds to like and sub if you're enjoying the channel, leave some feedback or engage in some discussion below. Thank you so much for watching and as always, I will see you in the next episode.